Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's presentation. I'm Bill Bush with Horizon Financial Group. I want to thank you for joining us today as we present six steps to legacy planning for the generations. Now, before we get started, just a quick introduction. I joined Horizon as a financial advisor about six years ago after a pretty long career in healthcare administration. In fact, some of the things I'll be talking about in just a bit, you know, I first encountered in the healthcare world, things like advanced directives and powers of attorney. Well, I'm the oldest of the three Bush brothers here at Horizon. So many of y'all probably know brothers, Pete and Andy. Andy and I work very closely on the retirement plans division here at Horizon, where we are the advisors on about 75 company retirement plans located across Louisiana and really kind of across the Gulf South, most of those being the 401k type plans. In fact, those letters you see next to my name, those are designations dealing with advising on company retirement plans. CRPS, that's the Chartered Retirement Plan Specialist, and the CPFA is Certified Plan Fiduciary Advisor. Now, in addition to some of that work, I also serve individual clients like yourself as we guide folks through our financial planning process that we call the Confident Wealth Experience. So we're going to start today's presentation by taking a look at a pretty interesting story of two different men who left their time on this planet in two very different ways. So I'm sure some of you know at least one of these two people. And it's probably the fellow on your right. You may not know the guy on the left, but if you have a good memory, maybe so. He's famous for delivering a talk that was based on answering this question. What wisdom would you try to impart to the world if you knew it was your last chance? What wisdom would you try to impart to the world if you knew it was your last chance? His name is Randy Pausch. He was a father, a husband, and a computer scientist at Carnegie Mellon uh, University in Pittsburgh. Now, Randy had already been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer when he was asked to give a last lecture, one in a series where professors imagine what they would talk about in their final lesson. Now, most people don't deliver under such pressing circumstances, which made his lecture really even more compelling. His talk to the students at the school, it was recorded, and you may remember it became a YouTube sensation. Soon he was on Oprah and Good Morning America. It's kind of the first viral video that I really remember. And then he finally came out with a book later called The Last Lecture. Now, here are some of the quotes from his last lecture and, and his book. His, his story really is remarkable because it showed great human resilience in the face of personal tragedy. He knew his time on earth was limited. And he knew the day that he died, as he said, would be like pushing his family off a cliff. So he set out while he was still strong to do what he could, to build a net that would catch them and cushion the blow of his departure. Now, here's a few quotes from the lecture and the book. The key question to keep asking is, are you spending your time on the right things? Because time is all you have. Another good one. Be prepared. Luck is truly where preparation meets opportunity. And finally, to be cliche, death is a part of life, and it's going to happen to all of us. I have the blessing of getting a little bit of advance notice, and I'm able to optimize my use of time down the home stretch. Well, Randy died quietly at home in July of 2008, about 10 months after he gave his last lecture. And he was surrounded by his family. And, you know, I think it's safe to say he left his family and his children and really the world with a deep personal message about his values, his beliefs, and his wisdom. And not just for his wife and children, but really also his children's children. And that, that chain of generations that we all have a link in. Now, I think if you could ever say someone had a good death, it was certainly Randy Pausch. Now, the details of Randy's death they really stand in contrast to those of this man. This is actor and producer James Gandolfini, and you may remember him as Tony Soprano. Yeah, the mafia crime boss and the lead character on the HBO hit series The Sopranos. Now, unlike Randy Pausch, James Gandolfini, he died suddenly at the age of 51 
while he was on a trip to Italy. And it was a shock to his fans and his family. Nobody saw that coming. Now, unfortunately, he hadn't done a thorough job in planning his affairs. He left 80% of his estate to his sister and his daughter in a way that triggered a painful $30 million tax bill. And unlike Randy Pausch, James Gandolfini didn't get to play a role in writing his final legacy. Instead, his ending well, kind of had a strong resemblance to that controversial last scene of The Sopranos. If you were a fan, you probably remember it. So Tony arranges to meet his family for dinner at a local diner, and first his wife arrives, then his son AJ, and Tony orders the fried onion rings for the table while they await his daughter Meadow. I believe a Journey song was playing in the background. Tony keeps looking at the door, checking for his daughter's arrival. The camera jump cuts to the daughter outside, awkwardly trying to park her car, and then back to Tony. The tension builds. He keeps looking up, and we're all wondering, hey, who's going to come through that door? Is it going to be Meadow or a, or a mafia hitman? <laughs> and then finally, yeah, the screen goes black. The finale to the six-season series ends, and the storyline left unresolved, no deathbed scene, no final words, just a jarring cut to black. Just as James Gandolfini, well, his real life ended too, a cut to black. So in the opposite manner of Randy Pausch, James Gandolfini didn't get to write his story for the ages. So I hope you can see in our little tale of two families here, a hint of the topics that we're gonna to touch on today. And namely, the importance and the seriousness, really, of, of thinking through your legacy and planning for the next generation. It, it's never too soon to do that. So, again, thanks for taking your time here as we look at legacy planning for the next generation. You may be wondering, so why is a financial professional talking about legacy planning? Shouldn't that be an attorney or somebody else? Well, we at Horizon, we do this as a service to our clients in the community because Really, we've seen some difficult, unhappy situations when families don't think about these issues. When no legacy planning is done, we see a range of unhappy outcomes that often impact multiple generations. And we're gonna talk about some of those in just a bit. Now, of course, we don't want any of that to happen to you and your family, so that's why we do things like this. Now, also be assured today is, is not a sales presentation. You will not hear anything remotely close to a sales pitch today, but we do have a lot to cover. And please note in trying to respect everyone's time here, we're not gonna take questions during the presentation so that we can be, be sure to get everyone out of here on time. But questions you know, are sure to arise. So at the end of the presentation, we're gonna let you know how to best get those answered. Before we end today, I'm gonna to give you some more information about legacy planning that will get you thinking and hopefully help you remember everything we've covered today. And also, I'll be extending an invitation to start developing your own legacy plan for your family. I'm going to talk about that in a bit later. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Kentwood Springs Water. Cool, crisp, and refreshing. All right, let's jump into it. I'm very excited to talk to you about legacy planning. So when it comes to today's topic, it's really not the old stuffy old version of traditional estate planning. Instead, we kind of see legacy planning in a broader, more positive light that will help you find meaning in your life and make sure it counts for something to your loved ones who will stay behind a little while longer. So as we saw in his last lecture, Randy Pausch recounted his childhood dreams, the outstanding people that he had met in his lifetime and the lessons he learned along the way. Now that lecture has been seen and read by millions of people. If you go to YouTube, there's several versions listed there, but one of them has you know 20 million hits. Really left a legacy. Now yours may not be as far reaching as his, but it will be just as meaningful to your own family and maybe even more so because it's yours. So let's continue trying to understand really the seriousness of the problem that many families face in this area and then we're going to look at solutions that can help you start and you and your family kind of avoid those worst case scenarios. All right, well, here we can see one aspect of the problem we face. Many people haven't thought through how they want their money and their estate handled after they're gone. 
Well, they think they have forever. You know, what could go wrong? And look, not reflected here are the people who have given it some thought, but not recently or, or not fully, kind of as in the case of James Gandolfini. So, but things, <laughs> excuse me, things certainly can go wrong and do go wrong. I mean, maybe you die before you get everything set up. You got hit by a bus before you even had a chance to tell people you love them, much less write a will or, or start writing down your memories. That's a pretty terrible thought, you know? But let's just consider what could happen in the aftermath of your untimely death. Well, of course, your, your family is left grieving and kind of in the dark about what you even own, where everything is, and really what your wishes are. Think about your closest next of kin, your spouse or your children. Of course, you know, first they're in shock to learn of your untimely death. So they start going through your papers. What will they find? Is it going to be a neat folder marked open in case of my death with all your assets listed and your wishes clearly spelled out? Or a hodgepodge of papers that really make no sense to anyone but you and, you know, now you're gone. Or are your estate planning documents, are they missing or incomplete or in conflict with one another? You know, perhaps you never got around to making a will. So no one knows who you wanted your assets to go to. Or if you did sign a will, maybe it conflicts with your beneficiary designation. You know, this happens. People update their will when they get remarried, but then they forget to update their IRA and other investment beneficiary designations, which possibly could still list the ex-spouse. So let me ask you, if you died tomorrow, how would your assets be distributed? Do you even know? Well, family members, you know, they could start arguing over what you would have wanted. Now, granted, you're not around to see the turmoil, but I'm asking you, you know, kind of imagine that now. Without clear instructions from you, what would your family members say to one another? Would there be arguments over what you would have wanted? You know, you may have heard of normal loving families who kind of turned on one another after a parent died without a will. That situation can certainly bring out the worst in people. If there is no will or trust, the estate is going to go into probate, and this means the court is going to take over and divide the assets based on state law. Now, this may or may not be what you would have wanted. Probate fees then deducted from your estate leaving less for your heirs. If you were to die tomorrow, do you know if your estate would owe estate taxes? Perhaps one of the worst things to contemplate about sudden death is leaving special sentiments unsaid. You know, there are people that say, I love you at the end of every phone conversation. You know, my daughter does it and I do it to her just to make sure it's the last thing said if they get hit by a bus. But that doesn't really do the job of telling your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, how you truly feel about them. Let me ask you, if you got hit by a bus tomorrow, and look, hopefully no bus drivers on this presentation, we're not trying to be hard on the bus drivers, but if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, what things will you wish you had said to the people you love? And in the end, the impact of your life has diminished between the confusion the family squabbles, messy estate planning, and all the things you wish you would have said but didn't, your legacy comes up short. The aftermath of your death is not nearly as positive, really, as it could have been. So what else could go wrong? Well, for some, you know, a fate worse than death is sudden incapacity. Say you suffer a stroke or, again, get hit by a bus, but rather than dying, you end up in a coma. In some ways, this is worse than dying unprepared because you have to go on living. So think of this, who will make decisions about your care? Someone you love and trust? Or will you be at the mercy of someone you don't know because you didn't set things up properly? Look, here's what can go wrong. Your medical wishes are not honored because no one knows what they even are and hospitals are obligated to do whatever is necessary to keep people alive, even if that means or involves ventilators and feeding tubes. Now, if this is not what you would have wanted, you have to make those wishes and you have to state them now. 
If you want to appoint a loved one to make medical decisions on your behalf, well, you have to set that up now while you're still of sound mind and body. And here's what else. You know, your money is frozen, your bills that can go unpaid, your investments are left un unattended because really you never signed a power of attorney appointing a trusted person to act on your behalf. No one else has the authority to transfer money or pay bills or do anything with your finances as long as you're incapacitated. So here's the problem. People equate estate planning with death planning and therefore they block it out and never do anything or, or at least not enough. And this quote kind of sums it up right here. One of the greatest obstacles in estate planning is the perpetuating of death denial. Most people don't want to plan for post-death lives because death is a scary topic to even think about. Death certainly is a very scary topic to think about. Now, this is true on both the financial level, but also probably even more importantly on an emotional and spiritual level. Uh, you know, that, that lifetime of experiences, hard-earned wisdom and insight that make up our values, they never get discussed and never get passed on to that next generation. And you know, that's, that's a real loss for everyone. So you may be thinking, well, my family knows how I feel about them. And, and I'm not a best-selling author or a Hollywood movie star, and I don't have tens of millions of dollars in the bank. So what's it matter if I don't take this issue seriously? You know, what could be the consequences? Well, the consequences of having no estate plan, quite frankly, are tragic. As, as Lawrence Greenberg notes here, heirs may be subjected to a number of obstacles, such as probate, creditors, lawsuits, judgments, and legal fees, all of which can compromise the value of the legacy. Common problems that arise when no one thinks about estate planning include no will or trust, Overlooked provisions such as, you know, think of guardianship for minors, no tax planning, financial strains, cash shortage for the survivors. Also, you know, sometimes decisions are not communicated to the next generation, details not revealed even till after death. So family tensions arise after the will is read. And then again, reluctance to make the plan or even update a plan. So, you know, really really not a good picture, right? Which is why attorneys, accountants, and financial professionals, they've been pressing their clients for years to, to do this, to do estate planning. The benefits of estate planning are very real. Here you see it. Spells out health care wishes. Possessions, go to heirs, you choose without wrangling or dispute. You know, it avoids additional unplanned legal expenses and provides for loved ones not otherwise protected. But traditional estate planning often doesn't capture the fullness of our lives and our values. So what's missing? Well, what's missing are really the intangible assets we've collected, often kind of the fruits of a life well-lived. And they include two types of things not included in traditional estate planning. You see them here, character assets. Now, these are your values, your health, your spirituality, your heritage. Think of your purpose, life experiences, you know, talents, and plans for giving. And then you have intellectual assets. So those are like your business system, skills, traditions, your wisdom, and reputation. Now, you're possibly saying to yourself, you're painting a grim picture here. We don't want that to happen to our family. Is there a way to achieve all these things, not just the nuts and bolts of that traditional estate planning? And the answer is yes, and it's called generational planning. And it recognizes that we are all really much more than just our physical assets accounted for in our estate plan. So here's our definition of generational planning. It's a modern, intentional, maybe even fun a little bit, two-phase process that does away with the worst aspects of estate planning and helps you plan your legacy. So generational planning, generational planning has really two objectives. Um, the first objective is legacy planning. 
a process for passing on a family's tangible wealth and assets, right? And the second one is conveying your family's values and history for the next generation. Now, both are done for the benefit of the next generation. It's also important to say that generational planning is not driven by documents in the way of a stuffier estate planning process may be. And so in thinking about the people closest to you, here are some key thoughts and considerations to a successful legacy plan for the generation. First, consider your spouse if you're married. Now, if you were to die first, you need to ensure sufficient income for the rest of your spouse's life, maybe through insurance or, or just making sure there are enough assets to draw from. You also want to make sure that whichever of you goes first, the surviving spouse would be able to manage the finances alone. You know, we, we see many cases where the husband maybe makes the investment decisions and the wife pays the bills, kind of see a natural division of labor in the marriage, and they're each doing kind of what they do best. But then one of them dies, and the other must take over without really having been trained to do what the other was doing. So in the successful legacy, a married couple, while they're both still alive, they plan ahead and make sure that either spouse can carry on and manage the finances, regardless of which spouse goes first. And then there's children. You know, children need to be prepared for their inheritance. We've, we've all heard of stories about trust fund babies and inheritors who really have no appreciation or respect for that money that was left them. And so without proper guidance and and direction, their tendency is to spend it rather than preserving it for their own future or for future generations. You know, inheritance planning starts with an understanding of the basic values upon which that inheritance was built, you know, which is often to preserve and grow your family's wealth. And these values need to be passed on to the kids. And then there are some practical matters of of how to specifically invest the money and how to withdraw it without incurring you know, unnecessary taxes and fees. And for the grandchildren, you would want them to understand how you lived and what you live for. You know, sometimes it's easier to skip a generation when passing along some of those values. Grandchildren usually have a greater appreciation really than children do for what life was like when you were young and what you learned from your experiences. So seize that opportunity now, you know, start sharing family stories and can conveying some of those memories and values that you grew up with. And, you know, and finally, I think about uh, all the people you've touched in your life. Think about the causes you care about, the, the organizations that are doing good work in the world, that, and you've contributed to them now. And maybe you'd like to leave something to them so they can continue on that good work. Now, naturally, you may be saying to yourself, okay, you know, this makes sense, but how can I do this in a way that is not really overwhelming, complicated, or extremely expensive? Well, you don't have to be overwhelmed. You know, there's a six-step process, legacy planning process, that you can start to leave your mark for the next generation. We're going to walk you through that, just a quick overview of these six steps. So the first one is really part one involves planning for incapacity. So we like to get this out of the way first because it's really so essential and quite frankly, easy to do. Incapacity planning is, is so easy and surprisingly so that it's really surprising everyone hasn't done it. People of all ages should do it because an accident or a stroke, that could happen to anyone at any time. And you know, there are forms for this. For healthcare, all you have to do is state a few simple wishes about how you'd want to be cared for and then name a person to interact with doctors and make medical decisions on your behalf. That could be your spouse, an adult child, or a close friend. Now for finances, you simply sign a power of attorney giving another person legal authority to act on your behalf. This would allow them to pay bills, transfer money, and, and what's needed to keep your finances kind of in order during the time you're unable to do it yourself. Again, that can be a spouse, adult child, close friend, or even a trusted professional. Now, the thing is, you must be mentally competent to sign these forms, which is why it's pressing, and we want you to do it now. 
Um, this is step one of our savvy legacy planning. One, you know, really once you've checked this one off, you're going to feel much better because you got something done and you'll be ready to tackle step two, which is getting organized. Now, you know, you've been meaning to do this, or maybe you are pretty well organized, but not in a way that would make sense to your loved ones if certainly or suddenly really you weren't even around anymore. So, you know, why get organized? Well, your objective in this step is to prepare for the real business of estate planning. First, you need to identify all the assets you own so you'll know how to divvy it up among your beneficiaries. Now, this includes things you might think about like savings accounts, investments, investment accounts, you know, uh, retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, real estate, you know, maybe your business interests or significant personal property, jewelry, artwork, Pete Bush's baseball cards, everything. But uh, before you ever sit down with an attorney, you really have to kind of have that list. Before you draw up those estate planning documents, you really need to have that intact. Another reason to do this is to determine really if your estate will be subject to estate taxes. If it is, that is if the total value of your estate exceeds the estate tax exemption amount, well, you'll want to talk to your attorney about some of the legal ways you can reduce or even avoid some of those estate taxes. If you go to the internet, you can read about many celebrities who didn't do the proper planning and whose estates owed millions of dollars in estate taxes that could have been avoided. If you don't read about a particular celebrity's estate plan, that means he or she probably did it right. They set up a trust that both save estate taxes and kept his or her affairs private. And of course, you want to make things easy on your spouse or your children. Make it so they have access to your important papers and passwords. Help them know what to do first, like, like taking care of your pets or even small things like getting your mail. In a non-legal letter to your survivors, you can really say anything you want. You can give them funeral instructions. Tell them what you want done with your social media, your Facebook account. Tell them uh, where the key to your home safe is. You know, it can be anything. And we can kind of help you talk through this, walk you through it. And in part three, you'll be thinking about the people you love and the causes that you care about. This is in preparation for part four, which is, that's kind of the real business of estate planning. So for some of you, part three is going to be easy. You'll, you'll want to leave everything to your spouse. And then you might have one or two favorite charities that you might want to support. But you have to think about contingencies. So what if your spouse goes before you do? Do you want everything to go to your kids, you know, divide it equally among them? Or do you want it distributed according to need? What about grandchildren? What about other relatives or friends to whom, you know, you may want to give part of your estate or or some of your prized possessions? And what if you have special situations like, you know, a child that you don't feel is really ready to handle an inheritance or maybe a special needs child who could lose out on medical benefits in the case of a large inheritance? You know, these are all things that, that really, you know, need to be considered before you start working on your estate planning documents. The more you've thought through your family and charitable wishes, the more efficient the estate planning process will be. And certainly, you know, the more money you'll save. Also in this step is the important process of preparing beneficiaries for their inheritance. Now, you know, some families may want to be completely open about what's going to, what everyone's going to get, while others, you know, may prefer to kind of be more secretive to avoid family battles. But, you know, maybe it's better to have those family battles if they're going to happen while you're still around to mediate. In any case, you want the people who will be inheriting your assets to know how to manage them, to carry on your intent to preserve and grow the assets and not spend them on frivolous things or lose them to taxes. This is the time that you really you need to talk to your spouse and kids about what they might get if you die and give them some lessons on how to manage their inheritance. This will be really an extremely valuable part of your legacy. And now we get to the traditional part of estate planning. All those decisions that you made in part three and who should get what, 
Well, they now need to be legalized. That is, there's going to be a need to, we need to get a mechanism rather to transfer those assets to your loved ones in a legal manner. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now, this isn't always done via a will. Sometimes you can transfer assets through account titling. If you hold title as joint tenants with right of survivorship, and if one tenant dies, the property will automatically transfer to the other joint tenant without going through probate. Another way is through beneficiary designations. You know, if you have an IRA, you would have signed a beneficiary designation in which you name the person or persons who inherit that IRA if you die. This also allows those assets to pass directly to the beneficiary outside of probate regardless, by the way, of what your will says. So the beneficiary designation trumps that. There are several legal ways, of course, to transfer assets to loved ones after death, but they all need to be coordinated. And you may have some accounts titled jointly. You may have some of those signed beneficiary designations. And you may also have the need to have a trust, really depending on how complex your situation is, and whether or not your estate is subject to those estate taxes we talked about. Yeah, you will also need a will, you know, kind of to pick up some of the leftovers not designated that we talked about before. Now, some of the, some people's estate plans are pretty simple. You know, they barely need to see a lawyer. They can do everything through account titling, those beneficiary designations, and a simple will. Other people kind of need more legal advice and we can certainly help you make that determination and refer you to an estate planning attorney when we get to this stage of the process. Or if you already have an attorney that you already work with, you know, we'll work with that attorney to coordinate things on our ends. If you have you know, on our end, if you have accounts here to make sure those accounts are titled properly. Now, depending on how much thought you gave to your beneficiaries in part three, this step really should be pretty quick and straightforward. It's a matter of just executing the wishes you already identified. Laying all that groundwork in part three will save you on legal fees. And at the same time, really don't want to rush anything. Talking to an attorney can sometimes really make you aware of the possibilities that you really didn't even know existed before, such as planning for those contingencies or drawing up the documents so they can't be contested. So good attorneys definitely earn their fees. And now we get to the fun part, and that is creating your family legacy. This is where you really make your life count for something by leaving behind a piece of yourself. Now, how would you do this really depends up, it's really up to you. You know, we have some worksheets and guidelines that can kind of get you started. You don't have to write a book like Raymond Polish did, or maybe do a YouTube video, but you might start thinking about how can I capture some of those memories, you know? Start writing down certain thoughts, such as what you want your children and grandchildren to really know about you. Now, you, you may be planning to compile family photos or favorite recipes to hand down. Maybe you have a special skill, you know, gardening or woodworking that you'd like to pass on to certain family members. Now is the time to start thinking about those intangible assets that will make your legacy so valuable to your family. Now, part six comes later, but it's really no less essential than parts one through five. And it's, it's great that, you know, you're doing this planning early, long before you leave this earth, but that means a lot can really happen between now and then. And so you will need to keep an eye on your plan and revise it if anything changes, because certain, certainly something could. So your plan is not set in stone. As your family composition changes, you'll certainly want to revisit that plan. Whenever there's a marriage, a divorce, a death, a birth of a child, some other life event, you'll want to take a look at your plan. Or you just might change your mind about something. You know, you can always amend your documents for any reason at all. Now, remember, you know, having the wrong people inherit your money is almost worse than no estate plan. So that's our six-part legacy planning process. Now, we're getting close to finishing up here, but we're going to review briefly. We just started out the whole presentation by looking at the differences between the Randy Pausch story and the James Gandolfini story. And the key takeaway there was, you know, your legacy is going to be written no matter what, for better 
or worse. So let's make sure we control the final narrative of your life because things can happen like death or, of course, incapacitation. And we saw the consequences of not being prepared, the pain, the confusion, the anger among family members that can be left behind. And then we were introduced to the concept we talked about generational planning and saw how that kind of differs from maybe traditional estate planning that you had in your mind. And that led us to the understanding that the first step in generational planning is to ensure that our tangible wealth and assets get left to the right people or organizations. And then to do that, we kind of just introduce you to the six steps of the legacy planning process. And as you look at those six steps, you're possibly thinking, well, that sounds like a lot to achieve. And certainly I get it. I feel that way too, because it really is. But but what we found over the years is when we work together with folks and guide people through that generational planning process, they experience a couple of things. I think the first is, you know, great relief that it's done. And the second is kind of some new excitement and maybe renewed energy to focus on, you know, the non-financial aspects of generational planning. Yeah, that's, that's the reflective part. It's not legal and it's not business. It's the part where we really get to look back on our personal journey and share the stories that we kind of carry in our hearts. And that is our gift to the next generation. You know, they may be words, stories, pictures, or actions that we talked about. They may provide hope. They may provide healing. But just as important are the things that we say and do that bring us meaning because we realize that we, we are the carriers of wisdom for our family. And so from each generation to generation, each of us is that link in the chain that binds our families together. And that link, that link is the mark we leave. That's our legacy. And that's why I think many of you maybe checked out the presentation today and certainly want to make this suggestion. Hey, Use us as a resource. Let's work together. So hopefully you're motivated now and ready to start some legacy planning. So let's maintain that motivation by taking a little action. So here's the idea. Working together, we're going to develop a plan for doing the many things that need to be done. Now, one of the reasons people don't get around to estate planning is that ta the, really the tasks seem too overwhelming and they don't know where to start. So we're going to break it into chunks for you where we establish some goals and establish a timeline for implementing. For example, in week one, you might sign your healthcare directive. In week two, you might sign the power of attorney for financial decisions. We have a checklist of the things that need to be done to get your plan in order. And together we can go through that list and check off the things as they're, as they're being done. And I think working together, we can kind of just help you stay on track. We can also share resources. So if you happen to need a referral to an estate planning attorney or a tax advisor, we can introduce you to some of the professionals we work with that we know are really good at what they do. So by working together, we can hold each other accountable. You know, we'll have frequent check-ins, deadline dates for getting things done. This is all, of course, for your benefit and kind of keep you motivated and engaged so you'll carry out those plans. And then you'll have a way for you to start we have that way right now. So if you look in the Zoom chat right now, there is a document that you can access. It's called the Legacy Planning Assessment. It's a quick 10 question assessment that you can go through. And then at the bottom, there's a section to fill out. So if you'd like to meet with one of our Horizon staff members to review, this is just a complimentary one hour or less meeting that we offer and if you complete that form, we can kind of take a look at with you uh, in that one-on-one -on -one meeting and we kind of step you through that legacy planning checklist and kind of identify what's already been done and what else needs to be completed. And we'll also come up with the next steps for the most critical issues that, that need addressing. So then coming out of that meeting, we can work with you in a variety of ways. We can act as your resource and kind of help you find the right people, as I mentioned, that you need for additional expertise and assistance on completing your legacy plan. Now, naturally, we can also help you with any financial planning and investment issues that relate to you or your family situation. So regardless, uh, you know, when you leave that planning assessment meeting, we're gonna send you home with 
a specific action checklist for starting and completing your legacy plan. And we want to help you be prepared and as organized as you can be so you have peace of mind knowing that you're taking the right steps to plan your legacy and share it with the next generation. Share your values, your wisdom, and your insight. And we want you to have control over your legacy like Randy Pausch did. And we don't want your family to suffer like maybe the Gandolfinis did. So imagine how you will feel when your legacy is all set. A trusted person is ready to step in and help with healthcare decisions or financial dealings if it becomes necessary. All your records are organized and accessible to your loved ones. Your spouse or other loved ones, they're going to be provided for after your death. So by leaving behind both tangible and intangible assets, you will be remembered for your unique contributions to your family and to the world. You know, legacy planning is not hard. You just you just have to get started. So again, let's work together. And that is going to wrap up today's presentation. So let's start with your free legacy planning assessment to see where you are in that process. And real quickly, going to introduce you to the Horizon Advisors who are available to meet with you about your estate and legacy planning. So your brothers Pete Bush here, Andy Bush. We got Clint Gotro. Pete and Clint are both CFPs, and you see myself. Bill Bush. Now, if you'd like to schedule legacy planning assessment review with one of our Horizon professionals, you know, again, download the legacy planning assessment that we put in the Zoom chat, fill that out and return it to info at horizonfg.com or simply just email us and say, yeah, I'm interested in getting together uh, with one of the advisors. If you already have an advisor here at Horizon that you're working with, you can reach out to them on their personal email or use the info at horizonfg.com email again. Now, if you have any questions about any of the information you saw in today's presentation, we're also going to ask that you use the email address and send us those questions. And also for attending today's presentation, we have available the Baby Boomers Guide to Legacy Planning. And we'd like to send this out as a thank you. And it's really a, a nice thorough guide. It kind of goes through all the steps that we talked about maybe even in a little more detail. And if we're going to follow up with an email after this presentation, and if you'd like to get a copy of this, we're going to mail it out to you. Just simply reply with your address. We'll get it right out to you. It's a great resource and a reminder, again, of the six steps that we went through on today's presentation. So please, you know, take us up on that. I think you'll enjoy it. Just a reminder, we do have upcoming presentations this summer. And let's take a look at those. In July, we're going to be talking about social, social security planning. That one is actually set for July 29th at the same time. So July 29th, 11 a.m., same bat time, same bat channel. In August, we're going to go to keys to cutting college costs. In September, managing health care expenses. And then in October, there's a lot being discussed right now on retirement rules and some changes being uh, possibly implemented on Capitol Hill. So we're going to review if there are any changes there. And then we'll have another presentation before the end of the year. So that's going to wrap it up. We really appreciate you for being on this Zoom today. Hope you got a lot out of the presentation. Uh, six steps to legacy planning for the generations. We hope to see you in July. Again, if you have any questions, reach out to us at info at horizonfg.com. That's going to do it. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us.